Okay, what is it that you have to start it with? Nice haircut, bro. Oh. <laughs> Dude, I simulated in my head the first thing that you were going to say. Um, and it was you mentioning the haircut. And I was in, uh, in my head, I was like, Dude, I don't even remember it. Yo, I'm gonna shave my head off though. All right, good. Um, it's Every gonna be, so, dude. I'm gonna pull up one day in some form, uh, and I'm gonna be bald. Good. Every, every day we get closer to the top tree. Um, bro, <laughs> when I was talking to um, the the Recon, mm -hmm. as we would say, bro, uh, she, I told her, I was like, yo, I'm gonna shave my head off as a test. To see what she would say, parentheses monk mode. She was like, "I would still, <laughs> I would still love you." And whatever Puerto Rican girls say, it's not a bad look, honestly. I've always thought that, like, if you shave your head, you just have to have a nice beard or be jacked. You just have to have one or all of them. Yeah, I like my hair. I like, I like having good DHT genes so far. <laughs> Bro, did you get the chance to see the Oppenheimer film? No, not yet, but I have plans to see it in a few weeks. All right. Um, did you see it? Yeah, I'm not even trying to gas it because, like, of course oh, I'm biased because I like this, but it was fire. It was well worth yeah, the I'm hype. Yeah, I'm going to see it. I'm going to see it. So, <laughs> dude, I I have his Wikipedia page open right now. Did you see the thing? I have, like, a few things, but did you see um, what is the name of the book is named after? Uh, the American Prometheus. Yeah, do you understand that analogy? Yes. Explain it's, it to me. Okay, so Prometheus was, he was a god, right? He was a titan. He was a titan, and he gave man fire, and so Zeus punished him by having a crow peck at his body. Right. What's the, what's the analogy? Um, I interpret it as, like, no discovery comes without a price. That's like a, a theme that you drew from it or like a, uh, what you would call moral. Yeah. Yeah. I would say like first time I heard that and after watching the Oppenheimer film, I would say just no discovery comes without a price to be paid. What's interesting about the Prometheus myth is that he gave humans fire, something that was only reserved for the gods. And a, a knowledge only reserved for the gods. And he subsequently had to pay for it. He was chained to a boulder in the Caucasus Mountains. And it, it, depending on the exact method, it's either a vulture or it, like some other predatory bird that would gobble up his insides. Classic, mm -hmm. classic predatory bird in the Caucasus Mountains move, like the eagle. Um, and then until... Of course, not of course, but whatever. Heracles uh, comes in and is like, hey, we got you. Get you out of here, bro. Gotta well, love the Greek mythology. Me too, me too. But the only, like, the only comparison that I would disagree about is that fire was a good thing, but nuclear bombs seems like a really terrible discovery. And I saw well, this poll actually on Twitter. Yeah. It was like, do you think the world is safer because of nuclear weapons. What were the poll results? 80% myself included were like, no. Nah, but dude. <laughs> Big dude. We got some but existential I danger. But bro, it's they're both tools. Depends on how you use it, I think. Right. So I wanted to bring this question up to you. Like, what do you think? If you think the world is safer? Personally, I think no. Because sure, yeah, whatever. We um we humbled Japan, but now it's like next time nuclear weapons are used, there's going to be retaliation. Um, I would say no, not no, not. But what? I can see why. There's good arguments on both sides, I think. But I could see. I think no, the world's not safer with the introduction of nuclear weapons but it okay so make, so make an argument for why it would be safer then because well, uh, it wasn't the bomb if the analogy is not fire to the bomb the analogy is fire to um what's called the the discovery of missing masses 
Um, so there, have you ever seen the binding energy per nucleon graph? No. So, so I, yo, pull um, it up. It's going to be the first time I pull oh, something up on the pod. That? Share. All right. Screen. Um, okay. Let's do this one. You know that bro, that was a great, that was a great move. Mm. Let me know when you can see my screen. I can see it. Can you see what I'm typing in? I think it's bar. delayed, but yes. Yep, I see oh, it. Wait. Can you see me now typing live? Yeah. Okay, cool. So binding energy per nucleon group. This is very exciting. So here, okay, let me see. Dude, I can also mark it up. Um, I think like with a pen or something. Dude, when you watch the film, you're going to see that the director, see Nolan, yeah. the director Nolan specifically put like little things about fusion and fission in the movie, which I thought were great. Oh, nice. Right. So uh, this dotted line right here uh, separates um, separates uh, the nuclei, nuclei by whether or not um, the result in separation or joining ha has an energy release. Um, so this is on the y-axis is basically how much energy it uh, takes to hold the nucleus together. The, the higher it goes up, the more stable it is. So um, this isotope of iron, iron 56 here is the most stable isotope of iron. Um, so when we're looking at fusion what's happening in stars we're going from hydrogen to helium so this jump in energy difference is the amount of energy generated by stars and that's also what uh, hydrogen fusion bombs the this is the um process that they are based on so you get this amount of energy mm. and that's I'm, and then I, yeah, I, know what, I, I know what you're talking about but for anyone that's listening in case they don't know what fusion and fission is do you want to explain that so fusion is the combining of atomic nuclei fission is the splitting of of them into smaller ones. All um, right. So you have, they just showed uranium, but I think a plutonium was used in, the, in one of the bombs as well as uranium. So movements from this area to up here, um, there's also a difference that can be exploited. You take high mass, uh, high mass isotopes like uh, 238, uranium-238, and you smash neutrons into them, and you also get a release of energy that, that is described by differences uh, in these elements, uh, which would be the byproducts of fission and the original nuclei that you're bombarding. Um, so the two bombs that were dropped from World War II were on the fission side. And there is, um, what was this found out is, I'm gonna stop sharing. What was found out is that um, if you add for fission, you have the original mass of your uranium nucleus, and when you bombard it with a neutron, it breaks up into two small nuclei. If you weigh those two small nuclei together, it does not equal the mass of the original uranium. So they they weigh less. Um, so there's these there's this thing. I think I'm pretty sure it's called missing mass. Um, there's something similar, but this missing mass gets converted uh, entirely to energy. Um, and, I think and, that, and that's the degradation ahead. component, right? Yes, that's so that mass turns directly into energy and that energy, um, it can be described by Einstein's famous uh, energy mass equivalency that everyone knows E equals MC squared. So the relationship between the amount of energy, pure energy associated with the mass is, um, is uh, just multiplied by the speed of light squared, which is a really mm. large number. And so, and so basically, that's why people get sick, right? Like after an atomic bomb, because of the, um, because of what you're saying. So with, uh, I don't know a lot about it, but what I do, what I would say is that um, the, so when you get these, when you have these nuclei splitting, you have a lot of neutrons flying around and like, and I think gamma wave radiation that will, that are able, so if you're like a, cancers caused by radiation would be because some some nucleon or a high energy electromagnetic wave uh, uh, collides with the DNA of, of certain of certain genes and will uh, damage the hydrogen bonds or the the like the phosphate sugar linkages in the DNA to cause it to cause it mm. uh, genetic damage. Bro, so there was a couple of things that stood out to me in the movie. Um, like. I I hope you get this shit to see it really soon, bro. Oh, like, no, I'm going to I, be seeing it in a few weeks. 
Yeah, because I know you're going to love it. But one of the things that I was thinking about was in that time period, just the amount of intellectuals that were living at the same time, because yeah. they show, of course, Oppenheimer, they show Niels Bohr, they show Heisenberg. Heisenberg, Richard Feynman, bro, Edward Teller. Um, yeah, and him and, uh, yeah. I didn't know this, but him and Oppenheimer had a lot of beef. Edward Teller? Yes. Yeah, dude, Teller wanted to uh, put all that, put some put some vibes in with the fusion, the two-stage fusion bomb. Did they talk yes, about with, that in the movie? Yes, with the, so what happens in the movie, the way they dramatize it is that Teller wants to make an H-bomb. Yeah. And Oppenheimer's like, no. And at first, Teller takes it personally. But then what I what I interpreted from the movie is that the reason Oppenheimer didn't want an H bomb to be created was because then the Russians would have no choice but to up their arsenal as well and create a H bomb as well, which is more yeah. devastating. It happens anyways, bro. It happens anyways. You know. Yeah, right. But then there's like th that's like the argument the movie presents, where it's like we're basically in an arms race. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because um, let's go back to the fire thing, right? Which we, which is we came the tangent from it's the discovery of that technology. Um, so this will tie back to what you're talking about is that the analogous fire isn't the bomb. The analogous fire is the discovery of that graph we just showed. Um, so that knowledge, because now we have nuclear reactors that provide energy to uh, to residentials, you know. So mm -hmm. same technology, and maybe we could someday create find the engineering uh, power to and ingenuity to create a fusion reactor same thing well if there's is a double-edged sword you know and that is true that is, that is that is the positive of it um so there's that but of course with the fire you could now and and uh use an analogy that like you could use the fire to to light like a piece of stick and smack a smack a lad with it or um or you could use it to like cook him up after you smack him you know? mm. <laughs> Yeah. Well, so what you're saying puts into context a scene in the film because Oppenheimer goes to talk to Einstein, right? Because when they were doing the calculations for the bomb, they were, there was a concern that the atmosphere would be set on fire. And then when they do the math, they're like, the chances are near zero, you know? And I wonder how they, what they were looking at for that. Yeah, right? Like there was a concern that they Sorry, were going to set the... Good. You're good. There's a concern that we're going to set that the atmosphere on fire, right? And then the calculations came out to near zero. And everybody was worried about that. But then at the end, they replay the same scene, and Oppenheimer goes to talk to Einstein, and Oppenheimer Oppenheimer tells Einstein like, the bomb worked, but like in a way we did set the world on fire because of how you're saying with the fire and Prometheus, like this is going to set off a new era, basically. Yeah, um, I was talking to people today, um, and I was like, I'm glad this is getting a lot of attention in general population because this is the biggest um, project in physics out of the 20th century, for sure. Yeah, I know, I know. I was thinking about that as well. It's like, like I, I don't know, I don't know how to say this, but like, it's crazy that this happened. You know, like they, they set off the two bombs in Japan and the fact that it's never happened again and we're oh, just living yeah. and it's and like, we're, but it could happen. We're, we might come to see a day where it's been a hundred years of the last nuclear weapon was dropped on a, on a population. You know? Yeah. Yeah. That, that really got to me after the film. I was like, wow, like this really I, happened and, every, and it hasn't every, happened since. It gets farther away uh, the day that it happened. It seems like, wow, that's, that's crazy. But um, let's go back. So the, the name of the original book, The American Prometheus, are you aware? So the punishment of Prometheus that we talked about, um, the analogy continues to the fact that, um, as we mentioned this in a previous episode, um, post-World War II, McCarthy era, communism persecution. He was a victim of that. So it's interesting, yes. too, that then it got turned around on him. The gods punished him. And now the American government ended up uh, smoking his beans, you know, yep. after. So the film, the film portrays the film that beautifully. I talked about that, right? Yeah, the film portrays that beautifully because um, you would think the movie is about the building of the bomb, which part of it is. But also, yeah, that's like, what I initially thought. The film is also about what happened after. And so after he was persecuted a lot because of his communist ties. And I don't know, I mean, how, how historically accurate this movie is, but in the film, they show that um, 
basically like he had sympathies, sympathy, like uh, sympathetic feelings towards the communist movement, but he wasn't an actual communist. You know, yeah, that's and, like, true. if you if you look on the histor if you look on the historical members on the Wikipedia page for CPUSA, he's not on there. You know, yeah. Um, but his his second wife is on there. Yes, and so second that's what they show. They show that he um he was romantically involved with a lot of communist the communists, females. Bro. Yeah. Yeah, dude. And, and you get <laughs> and so, so then, funny. Dude. So then after he sets off the bomb, he, you know, becomes the father of the atomic bomb or whatever. Yeah. And he uses that clout to basically try to control policy. Uh -huh. You know, and that's basically why they pushed him out. That's yeah, why they had to um, come after him so hard. Yeah, dude, and it's uh what do you so going along with that, what do you think about this? Two main reasons why the bombs dropped. One was to uh, win in the Pacific Theater, and then the second one uh, would be well, the war is coming to a close anyways. At the end of at the end of this war, that's going to be uh, Russia and America out on top, and anticipating the next few decades, uh, potentially seeing some uh, geopolitical competition show a flex to them in the form of of this bomb. Yeah. Yeah. So, so let me tell you something I saw in a comment section today. And I, I, again, I don't know the historical accuracy of this, but it made me think. So in a comment section, I saw people were saying that Japan was going to surrender anyways. Right. But the U S still chose to drop the bomb just as a show of force. I didn't hear that. I'm, I'm not. So I don't, yeah, I don't think I've ever heard that personally. Yeah. I've always been taught it was a gamble that they might not even surrender after the fact. It was, I don't know if it was you and I who talked about it on, on these episodes, uh, but what was happening in the Pacific theater, um, as far as the com the culture of the combat, like you could not take the Japanese uh, soldiers prisoner. So, it seems pretty obvious that that would come into play in the calculations to what types of measures would be needed to, to finish to finish the war in the in the Pacific Coast because it was estimated over a million uh, soldiers on each side would die. Or, I mean, soldiers plus civilians, but like just people on each side would die. Yeah, and so I learned exactly what you learned that the Japanese were just were very prideful people and they were never going to surrender. And just, I mean, I of course whoever's in war has a terrible, but based on what I know about the Pacific and European theaters, I would much rather have been in the European theater because the Pacific theater was very extreme because the Japanese took prisoners and they tortured them and they're very prideful. And they like, there's even a story of a Japanese no, soldier that was gonna- ja You ain't taking the Japanese prisoner, bro. They'll be like, they're on some samurai waves, bro. Yeah, no, that's what I'm saying. Like the Japanese took American prisoners and they tortured them and, um, even after the war, I've heard a story of like, there's a soldier that never surrendered. The wait, when he was um, captured by the Japanese. Who? Is that, the, is that what you talk about? This guy, um, or are you talk about on the Japanese side? Yeah, no, I'm side. saying on the Japanese side, I'm saying oh, the Japanese. Was it the guy who was like underground? I think so. I think he was like up in the hills or something. And he That's just kept on fighting. Shit, That's some funny shit. But yeah, so I knew I knew just based on historical background that the Japanese were just very vicious and very prideful. And it's at least the way I learned it is that they weren't going to surrender. So I understand the argument as to why they dropped it. But then uh, just, you know, reading other historical pieces, I've seen that like very often this happens. It's like it's a common theme in history where large wars happen and then there's a sustained, a sustained peace for like 70 to 100 years. You know, but this and time then, it's different. What do you mean? This time is different because the way that we ended this war. That's very insightful. Because, well, now, though, yeah, yeah we are no longer. Um, well, you can just look at in general the relationship between Japan and America. Mm. Of course, though, after we could uh, do it, it's synthesized 
and the Prometheus myth back to Oppenheimer, um, the consequences that he paid. What, so he, of course, was involved, as we were just talking about, in the Communist Party. And you, I don't know if it talks about this in the film, but there's a lot of the vast majority of intellectuals at the time across academic subject matter uh, were involved in communism. And as we, as we talked about this in an earlier episode, this phenomenon is what Jordan Peterson cites as to why the universe, the modern universities are existing in this po um, postmodernist uh, Marxist like ideological inception into the mm. or in, into universities but um yeah i don't know did the film talk about a lot of these people who were extremely intelli intelligent and intelligent yes. intellectual fields that were yeah and so they do portray that there's a lot like throughout the film um even when oppenheimer comes to america to start a uh, quantum physics program there's like half of the staff and half the students are either pro or against communism and then this, I mean, I mean, like you're an intellectual as well. This kind of seems like a neck, like a natural no, I'm, thing. I, like, I'm an idiot. I'm a, <laughs> I still wear diapers, bro. I'm still on the, I'm still on the <laughs> diaper. And I've only been eating soup for the past 10 years. But anyways. Mm. Well, I was going to say, um, I feel like when you're curious, like you kind of wander off in that direction of communism. And then you come back and you see like why it wouldn't work. Or you stay there. Open-mindedness. You know? Or you, or yeah, I think that, that it's a novel, it's a novel philosophy at the time it was emerging out of basically what has been seen as Karl Marx talks about in, in the Communist Manifesto. Um, the class struggle has been going on for basically the history of mankind he identifies like it and then of course uh, the industrial revolution magnifies that trillions you know mm -hmm. you start getting production and manufacturing and i think to a lot of people who are working on the cutting edge of their field that was what was on the cutting edge of the political field you know and you have to have i think you have to have a certain degree of open-mindedness like you're saying Exactly. Yeah. So the film does a really good job of portraying that. There's mm -hmm. a lot of people that were open minded and they were just seeing where these things went. And also, I like how they show how at the time the U.S. Socialism Party was concerned about issues in America. But later on, and like when they do the McCarthy trials in the film, they show that that was conflated with Soviet communism. What do you mean? So. I mean, again, I don't know how, how historically accurate this film is, but there's a character in the film and she says, I joined the party because the party in America was concerned about issues in America, right? Not because I was like a Soviet sympathizer. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think at the time, do you think that I wonder the U.S. government was super prepared. Well, I mean, the McCarthyism is like, it doesn't matter how you're tied. If you even have one pinky in the other door, mm -hmm. we're, <laughs> we're going to smoke your beans, you know? Yeah. And that, in a way, that's how it is today, but on the, on a, sort of an, an, an inverted polarity. Mm. So here's another thing. I, I, I put two and two together. And so did you get seven? <laughs> <laughs> so you know what i've been uh i've been checking out dostoevsky right and crime yes, and punishment. we talked about that Fuck yeah. okay so in the film they show this and i would imagine too just if you were him like oppenheimer creating the bomb you feel immense guilt for all the people that died in japan so in the film he goes on trial right and people are like don't do it like they're setting you up for failure and he's like i'm gonna do it and he's like, I have my own reasons. And then there's a scene in the film that tells you why. It's because he feels that he, if he makes himself a martyr in front of everyone and lets everyone punish him, that somehow it'll alleviate his guilt that he feels. Huh. He won't. <laughs> he's like, I have to live with this greater punishment, a spiritual punishment, maybe. 
Yeah, and, and um, that's where that's he never where admits it. He never like admits anything that he regrets the bomb, apparently. But his, uh, of course, the FBI was keeping tabs on him, and they were keeping a no like um, descriptions of his psychological state. And after the bomb was dropped, apparently he uh, was be like being described as like uh, kind of all over the place. Yes, and they do show that in the film. He's having like PTSD, and he's yeah. like imagining things, and he's feeling immense guilt. And that's also, again, again, why he was against the H-bomb with Teller, because he didn't want to up the ante. Yeah. What, do you th- what do you think, bro? <laughs> Dude, make the H-bomb or not? I'm like, H-bomb Dude. all the way, bro. We, next, let's rip antimatter, bro. Rip antimatter, then rip black holes. Easy money, dude. Dude, in this case, I just wish I was an American because I'm just automatically biased. So what I'm going to say is that since the Germans discovered uh, fusion, right? It's fusion that they discovered. The Americans at first discovered fusion, and then the other side. No, no, like all, like all the way back. Like what kicked off the what kicked this off? Right, it was fusion, correct? And the whole the whole concept. Yeah. N- no. Okay. Small, well, big to small when it was first. Well. We'll come back and fact check this. We'll, we'll come back and fact check this. But um, so it's fission, right? That was discovered first, yeah. and it's yeah, a, and so it was it was small. discovered it was discovered by the Germans, and so yes, basically, true, basically, yeah. basically, since the Americans like since we're at war at the time, like we have no choice but to create the atomic bomb, you know, because there was concern that the Germans were doing it as well, and then later on, there's concern that the Soviets are doing it, and so that's why I'm saying like. I'm biased as an American because I feel that way. Like, I'm like, well, if we hadn't dropped that bomb, then someone else would have. But that's, that's a very post hoc argument, you know, like, that's what I'm saying. It's not a strong foundational argument. And, uh, well, it's a really hard frame because you and I both growing up in the American education system with the history context. All we know is the U.S. His, is the U.S. point of view from U.S. education, and that's a hard. And that was like a decade and a half of that, um, you know, of learning those in history uh, that in history classes. Um, that early on and for that long, it's like. You can't, it's, it's hard to conceptualize escaping that frame that America was the good guys, essentially, you know? Mm. And I mean, all evidence that hey, was delivered to me by my teachers and professors it keeps that in the light that America was like the good guys and a good thing that they um, developed the first because if Russia or uh, in the Cold War context developed, had developed the first and then dropped it um on japan and uh, like we didn't know about it i'm like dang man mm. they got they got the power they got some power over there in siberia right right and so and so that's why we're biased and you they know? talk about that in the film as well because um before they te- they before they even set off the first test Germany they surrendered. Nachos, bro. Oh, dude. And they're like, yo, it's about to be easy mode. We only got to take out the Japs, bro. Yeah. So the scientists kind of start to question and be like, why are we still doing this? Germany surrendered. And then Oppenheimer comes in and he's like, the same argument we just made. If it's not us, then who? Bro, and then, of course, politicians be like, yo, that doesn't matter. We still got to get in on this money, bro. We got to be developing this stuff because... We're go- we just gotta we gotta beat everyone, bro. The product of evolution. Exactly, and so it's like tech goes to war. Be like being American now is just basically like being the child, being a spoiled child of rich parents, you know. Because World War Two was like one of the most terrible, greatest endeavors ever faced by humanity, right? And U.S. Uh, like America came out on top. And we're all living in that post golden age happiness, and we're just spoiled. We're just gonna come out of it a little bit in in an uh, interesting way too. Yeah. Um. 
you know, that's a conversation for another podcast for sure. But, um, so last thing I had, uh, written down today that I want to talk about was the, uh, Robin, uh, Oppenheimer's Julius Robert Oppenheimer's, um, psychological states. He had, I found three uh, interesting episodes. I think they talk about one of them in the, or they just, they show one of them in the film with the apple he poisons his tutor's apple. Yeah. When so that's I, what I'm, that's what that's what I'm telling you. That apple portrays what crime and punishment by Dostoevsky talks about in his book, where it's like humans do bad things and then they feel bad about them immediately and then they want to be punished. So what is the so how does that analogy carry to the apple? And um, okay, so, so he was so he was being ostracized by his professor, yeah. and so he gets fed up and he poisons the apple. And then he leaves and on like on vacation or whatever, he's with his mates and he comes to his senses and he's like, what did I just, what did I just Dang, do? man, I just poisoned homie's apple. Yeah. Bro's so like, he... bro's sipping a mar marg on vacation. Dude's got two Brazilians <laughs> by his side. Dude thinking about Adams. And he goes, dang, man, I shouldn't have done that one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Tell me that hasn't happened to you. <laughs> oh, for sure, dog. For sure. Yeah, and so he rushes back and like gets the apple, but it's like, and then he eats it himself. It's like, ha! I will hurt me. <laughs> no, no, no! <laughs> like, you, like, of course, a film can't portray it, but like, you know, as humans, we all know we do things we regret and we want to be punished for them. And like, they don't show the punishment in the film, but I know through looking at his biography that he just was tortured by that, that he poisoned that apple, and he was honestly very lucky that he even got to stay in university. Yeah. Right. So the other two uh, events, did they show him strangling his friend? When when uh, he gets married, right? Yeah. No, they There's don't, that. but I knew about that, yeah. You knew about that? Yeah. Oscar. Dude, I, th I, th dude, I think my research, bro, we're trying to be journalists. Yo! <laughs> Fist bump, let's go. That's what I'm talking about, G. What did you do? That one, and then did you know about the train? Which, the, with the girl? I might not know about the train. Tell me about the train he saw this couple um they were they were exchanging oral pleasures and the guy left to like go get some like some some k or something some cigs and um he just hops on the girl and starts making out with her and it's like nah, out of here what, what are you doing man and then he just cries i didn't know about <laughs> that but that's insane Bro, right? That's both of those stories. The strangling of homie and train girl are wild, bro. Dude, even just the apple is insane. <laughs> when I heard about the apple, I was like, what? Because I almost zoned out when I was like, um, listening to this, um, it's like biographical description of him. And, um, I was like, are they still talking about Oppenheimer? He poisoned the apple for his tutor yeah so here's the interesting thing thing i was thinking about this anybody that's ever remembered in history and that's important is a very complicated figure i had the same exact thought when i when i heard about all all that uh all that stuff um it it seems pretty frequently um that great thinkers in general and those who have a, a large body of accomplishments are like idiosyncratic in a lot of parts of their personalities and their behaviors. Yeah. That's why there's like that thing, right? That like genius is madness. Right. Yeah. Um, I've heard similar, uh, anal analogous statements for sure, you know, and that is kind of ties to what we were just talking about with the communism thing, you know, uh, mm -hmm. I think is in general, the five personality traits, the the most common one amongst um, the great intellectuals, the great thinkers of of history, is that they were extremely high in openness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's a, yeah, exactly how you're saying. Like, I feel like I feel like all intellectuals flirt with communism, but I I think. The thing I think that they you should, you, you got to, uh, for like, I mean, open my, you should just consider all. Yeah. This is my opinion. My and opinion. also, you just have to put in a caveat that it's just like, 
actual communism has never been implemented. But of course, you and I has have had this discussion why it may or may not be possible. Yes. Um, so it, of course, it has not been thanks to, in my opinion, thanks to the fact that Stalin had uh, had Trotsky taken out with a pick at over the of the ice pick in South America, bro. Um, so if Leon Trotsky would have taken the position that Lenin wanted him to, I think we would have potentially seen an extremely different history for the entire world. That was one of, I was talking to Casper about that. that was one of the things we were talking about that night after the boat party was that, uh, wow, if Trotsky got the spot that Lenin wanted him to have, we would be in an extremely, extremely different world right now. I think a lot of, uh, I think a lot of, of stress on everyone in more developed countries would be a lot lower. Yeah, I know. And I, I love all these little butterfly effects, you know, because we're all the culmination of, of everything that's happened. Right. And um, yeah, communism's never the, the, uh, the math is there, the quote math. And if you read the communist manifesto is there and there's no logical reason why communism shouldn't work. So, uh, socialist economy, but the fact is that, um, the um, the large driving force for our behaviors is deeply evolution evolution uh based and uh, for that case it is we are inclined more towards selfish uh, behaviors especially in large populations where we are uh, alienated between ourselves so Karl marx of course talks about alienation from the product but in large populations people are alienated from each other and this is why i think the main reason why communism we do not see it working in like any nation today it's too large right yeah and because on paper it sounds very good and i think that is why a lot of the uh, the intellectual community in the 40s, 50s, 60s. Uh, it was very popular because it's like, oh, on paper, this theory looks very good, but we don't see great results. Um, you know, it, it is like Russia, a bunch of people were about to, were about to die, and um, France, third estate, uh, that one ended up uh, with some people. Hold on, brother. Their My end, you're cutting off. up really badly. Let me fact check myself. What's up? Hold on, brother. On my end, you lagged really badly. Now I can't see you, but I can hear you. Oh, really? I think we'll be good though because you, yours has lagged too, but I think it works out okay. Yeah. So what were you saying? Is was it good now? Said? About the, the the implementation versus, um, you know, theory versus implementation. Because, you know, they do bring that up in the film. Like that comes up between um, between Oppie and his friends where it's just like Oppie's a really good theorist. But like, can your theories be put into implementation in the physics realm, you know? But I feel like this happens in across all. In the physical world. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. The... Um... So no, that was the last part that I wanted to talk about was the psychological state. Him with those two girls, um, the girl situations, and then the apple guy. Right. So you want to call it here? I think what I think I'm gonna do is head out and try to get. A little bit of development going on antimatter, but that's that will be the next one. All right, these cowards. We're at thirty nine minutes, so we 